With this here, this ain't about being flashy. This is game day, son. It's only about one thing. Getting that W. That's the only thing that matters right now. Boy, are you ready? The past is the past, you know? It's a new day, bro. I'm gonna put it on my day. Cause it's gotta do it now. All right, guys, Blindside Fantasy Football Podcast back. Going to uh, do like we always do every Friday, recap last night's Saints-Falcons game, preview the Week 12 games, play uh, you know our new favorite segment, Let's Talk About Flex, and do it a little bit differently today with some of your questions. Give the bold predictions. But before we start, you know, Rob, you know, tell us about your random encounter last night. Tell the listeners about this little highlight of your uh, your week probably. Yeah, yeah, this was funny. I was, uh, I was at a... Uh, a GameStop for the Xbox release at midnight, and uh, I had a few hours to kill, so I went over to a to an Applebee's right next door and just grabbed some drinks and an appetizer. And I'm I'm sitting at the bar, and I look over at this guy, and he's got Blindside Football on his phone, throwing up on his phone. He's looking at our rankings. I see him scroll up. I see the logo. So I so I asked him about it. He's like, Yeah, yeah. I watched the I watched the pod. Listen to the pod. His name's Steve. So. Uh, I told him to uh, reach out to you, let us know his questions, and we'd throw a shout-out to him. But uh, Applebee's Steve, uh, thanks for uh, thanks for all the uh, all the uh, looks at the website and the listening of the pod. We appreciate it. Apple, Applebee's Steve, I like that. That's great. Yeah, hey, there's another note in that little story, too. Uh, he said that he was there for the 12 o'clock release. All three of us were. I think that pretty much proves we're a bunch of geeks, and uh, you can usually trust geeks, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Trust Trust the geeks, and uh, guys, I just wanted to mention real quick, too, you know, if you enjoy the pod, and obviously you do if you're listening to it, make sure you go on to iTunes, give us a, you know, a five-star rating, maybe leave us a small review if you got the time, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, Saints-Falcons game, though, you know, Pierre Thomas didn't didn't quite have, you know, the day I expected, but still, you know, 130 yards, had him as my running back 11 this week, pretty bold call, but, you know, still worked out pretty well for you. Jimmy Graham, though, looks like he he is back. I mean, five for 100 and a touchdown on seven targets. Uh, just wanted to point out, I, I am so upset kind of for multiple reasons about Jimmy Graham last night. I'm in a league that it limits the transactions you can make throughout the season, which I think is just utterly ridiculous, utterly ridiculous. Uh, apparently, I reached my limit without even realizing it. So this week when uh, my quarterback is Nick, Nick Foles and he's on bye, can't even pick up a quarterback this week, so I'm quarterbackless in a PPR league, and the guy had Jimmy Graham go last night, so uh, not only am I down 21 points now, but I also have no quarterback to help me even remotely get back in this, so guys, what do you think? Is Jimmy Graham back? Yeah, I don't think he ever went anywhere. I mean, he's still not quite getting the snaps he was in the beginning of the season. You know, this, this foot issue isn't going to go away, but, um, you know, even the first week we heard about it, if he's going to be utilized in the red zone, certainly he was more than that last night, but um, I, I think he's just fine. You know, probably not quite what he was to start the year when he was 100%, but, you know, not worried about Jimmy. Yeah, he can he can get it done with limited snaps, especially against Atlanta. I had him lowest out of all of us this week, but still at four. And I've said in past weeks, at top four, I can pretty much go anyway, but Graham can produce on limited snaps. I wouldn't be worried. Speaking of uh, speaking of guys that are back, Stephen Jackson, guys. I mean, another guy I got the got the luck of playing against this week. Uh, you know, sixteen for sixty three and a rushing touchdown, three for sixteen receiving. Is he back? Yeah, I talked about it last podcast. Eleven for forty one two weeks ago. Um, I, I thought I saw some good signs, and I kind of liked the matchup last night because of the way uh, you know you beat the Saints by running the football, um, keeping that offense of theirs off the field as well. You know, he looked good, but this this is a team that's just in a, in a rough situation. I know they kind of looked better last night. You saw the effort there. Um, you know, I, he's top 20 for me rest of the season, but he's not going to ever live up to, you know, what I was thinking preseason. Yeah, for me, I don't – I don't – I'm not buying that he's back. I had him lowest out of all of us this week at 30. Um, he'll probably move up a little bit, but I think what he showed us is he's touchdown dependent in mat, in good matchup games. Um so, you know, you did. You mentioned, obviously, the team is in a rough situation, but with this matchup, I, I'd expect uh, almost more uh, out of Steven. So, for me, I don't, I don't think he's back. I think he's still 
he's still a solid flex running back two, but um, yeah, he's not close to that running back one we thought he had the potential to be uh, when the year began. Yeah, I think I'm with Rob here. I mean, 16 for 63 is not exactly lighting the world on fire. And, I mean, if you're a starting running back in the NFL, you have just as, I mean, aside from a few people, you're Adrian Peterson's the world and things like that, but you have just as much, much luck at getting a rushing touchdown as Steven Jackson did in this game. So, I mean, probably a little fluky. You know, it was a one-yard touchdown run, <clears> a little easy thing, but 16 for 63 doesn't exactly, you know, set the world on fire for me. Steelers, Browns, the Joe Hayden factor. You guys, I mean, th this is a legit thing, obviously. You know, do you think we're looking into this a bit too much? You know, Matt, you seem to still like Antonio Brown in this game. You have him at 15. You know, I, I didn't realize this until I started getting these podcast notes together, but double-digit fantasy points um, in, his, in his last three games, and he's had at least five receptions in every game this year. I mean, that's amazing. Five receptions. That's uh, Matt. What do you what do you like about Antonio Brown? Is it that? Is it the consistency of the work that he's getting? Yeah, exactly. It's the consistency. Um, you know, last week I loved. I still liked AJ Green, and look what Hayden did to him. So uh, Hayden is certainly about as good as it gets in the league, and it's certainly going to be a tough matchup for him. But you know, the consistency, like you said, of Antonio Brown is why I ranked him so high. Um, he's by far their best guy. I know AJ was as well. Uh, Hayden could put a big stop on him, but I just, you know, I believe in the talent of Antonio and uh, and Ben. So, uh, believing in the talent of Ben Roethlisberger, there's there's a downfall for a lot of teams right there. Uh, you know, guy, guy I hate in this game, and I, I always hate him. Le'Veon Bell, you know, I got him all the way down at 25. Rob, you got him at 16. Matt at 17. So you guys are significantly higher than me. Talk me off the cliff. Why, why am I crazy on this? Why has my Le'Veon Bell hate gone too far? It's just all about the work, and you see that he gets the opportunities. Uh, you see that he gets the touchdowns, and I've said this a million times. I'll say it again this year in the NFL, being a top 20 running back isn't saying much. So it's not that I love him. Just, you know, getting the work. There's not a, guy, a lot of guys getting it. Yeah, and for me, it's the work and then the consistency of, of the quality that, that he's providing. I mean, running back this year has been a pretty volatile position, it's tough to be able to rely on a guy week in and week out. And Le'Veon Bell, he's had, um, in five straight games, he's had either 88 total yards or a touchdown. So he's he's been that steady uh, producer that, that you need. So for me, I feel comfortable putting him there because of the consistency. Uh, whereas maybe if I took the upside of a guy slightly below him, uh, I would feel a little less confident having him so high. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I feel... I, I guess I got to start looking at his receiving more because he does finish really well with a lot of total yards, but you just look at those those rushing totals and it just makes you sick. I mean, you, you don't get points for yards per carry, Marcus. No, you don't. I mean, you're you're absolutely right, and and even having low rushing numbers didn't stop me from loving Darren Sproles at the beginning of the year and loving Pierre Thomas now. So I mean, I guess I got to look past that. I just <clears throat> just something about him that I that I hate. I just hate it. Um, guys, I got a question for you though here on the Brown side. We'll see how good you guys are at this. Fill in the blank. Since week five, when Brian Hoyer went down, Jordan Cameron is a blank is blank in fantasy points. What rank is he in the NFL since Brian Hoyer has gone down? For tight ends. For tight ends. Yep. I bet he's number twelve. I'd say so. He did tight end ranking since week five? I'd probably say sixteen. By, by fantasy points, he is the tight end 18. Ooh. That is terrible. I mean, to, to use Rob's words, that's droppable. <laughs> I mean, that is just – that is that is horrendous. Uh, I mean, Matt, you're, you're a Jordan Cameron owner. You're still still rolling with him, still not worried about it? Well, I mean, what am I going to do with this time of the year? There's not there's nothing really out there. Um you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna recommend the Hauslers of the world. You say the Rob Hauslers um, of the world? No, I mean, it, he, I think what's happened to him is he's slidden back into that big pile of crap tight ends. Uh, maybe he's in in the front of that pile of crap tight ends. Um, you know, he still had six receptions last week. Twenty nine yards is nothing to be excited about, but at least you know he got some work. He is a talented guy, so. Um, you know, unless you've got Jimmy Graham or Gronkowski, you're not super excited about your tight end regardless. Yeah, that's a good good point, good point. 
Bucks Lions, you know, I, th- I think this is going to be fun. You two get to kind of battle it out here a little bit and explain to me both of your guys' sides. But Matt, you got Vincent Jackson at number two this week, but Rob, you have him at eleven. I'm kind of in the middle at eight. So each of you argue your case and tell me why I should sway more towards one way or the other. The Lions have been really good against the run uh, recently, and passing uh, against them has been extremely easy. So, um, you know, Vincent coming off a big week, I just I just like the matchup. They're going to have to score. Detroit's got a great offense. Um, you know, Bobby Rainey, I think, is, is a talented guy that they're going to have to actually – uh, game plan for, which is going to help um, Jackson. So I guess that's my reasoning. I just I just like the matchup more than anything. Detroit is just awful. Yeah, for me, I I pretty much was sold on Jackson. I mean, the, I mean, in these rankings, they shouldn't be shocking, you know, because this is what Jackson does. He he literally is either the second best wideout or the eleventh best wideout. Or the 11, just to point out, too, 11 is not a bad ranking by any means. It just no. I like seeing the disparity between the two. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, I think 2 is a little bold. I think 11 is a little closer to that middle of the roller coaster up and down. But, um, you know, I, I don't think he's a bad start. As Matt mentioned, it's a great matchup. Um, you know, it should be interesting this week. I'm really interested to see what Rainey does as an encore to last week. and and how much the run game plays into this. As, as Matt mentioned, Detroit's a little stronger against the run, so uh, we'll see. But but I think this is a middle-of-the-road game for Jackson. I thought 11 was sort of a, a safe uh, safe ranking, but I wouldn't be shocked to see him at two. Yeah, we'll talk about Bobby Rainey, I think, here in a second. But for what it's worth, I mean, I kind of started looking into this a little bit more to see why you guys had such a disparity, why Matt had him all the way at number two. And I was really surprised to see how poor the Lions' pass defense has been. I mean, they're allowing the second most amount of, uh, of fantasy points to wide receivers this year. And over the last four games, just four games, they've allowed 50 receptions, 873 yards, and 10 touchdowns to wide receivers. That's just wide receivers. That's not adding in what they've allowed to the running backs, the tight ends, and everything else. I mean, that is a ton of fantasy points almost 37 fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers over the last four weeks on average. That's a lot of fantasy points. That's going to be a lot of fantasy goodness, I think, for for Vincent Jackson. And he's probably, you know, after reading some of those stats, I think he's going to creep up a little bit more for me because he should definitely be in the top five, I think, this week. Uh, But you guys mentioned Bobby Rainey. You know, for me personally, I think we should kind of tame our expectations for Bobby Rainey. You know, the Lions are not the Bears. The Bears are a terrible, terrible run defense. And since week six, the Lions have only allowed 2.5 yards per carry to opposing running backs. And on the season, they're allowing just 3.6 yards per carry. So they kind of shut down the run. But uh, to Rob, your point, you think they're still gonna, that they're still going to give Rainey a lot of work here and that's going to kind of get him into that flex, that flex territory? Yeah, I think the volume alone is flex-worthy. And the Lions been stepping up. Since Martin went out, you know, they've, they've plugged him they've um, in there, and, and he's been able to be productive. But like you mentioned, the only part that scares me is the matchups. Uh, you know, this week against Detroit's a pretty solid matchup. Next week against Carolina, that that's a, a really hard matchup, uh, despite New England uh, running the ball fairly effectively last week. But then Buffalo uh, and San Francisco and St. Louis, I think that's one of the tougher uh, end of season playoff schedules for a running back. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where you still got a couple of days left to kind of sell high on Bobby Rainey, and I, I really think you should. Matt, what are your thoughts on Bobby Rainey? Well, uh, earlier you mentioned you know Detroit's not Chicago. They, they played Atlanta last week. So yeah, so but run defenses. I agree. I agree with you. Yeah, um, and actually, I think Atlanta's probably maybe even worse. Yeah. Um, so. I agree. I kind of agree with Rob. I don't like the matchup this week for Bobby, um, but I think the work's going to be there. You're going to see, you know, we talked about a few minutes ago with Le'Veon Bell. Um, it was 30 carries to four last week with Brian Leonard. Leonard started the game. Rainey came in on the second drive, um, ripped off like three yards of 10 yard, uh, three pl- runs of 10 yards in a row or more. Um, I think the workload's going to be similar. Not quite 30 carries, but I'm saying the disparity between the two guys uh, he had two receptions last week. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets a little bit more involved in that. 
Um, he's a guy that does well in the open field, so why not try to get him out there? But, you know, Marcus, the stats you gave, Detroit's been solid, so I'm not expecting a 163-yard day, two touchdown, you know, um, but a decent day, and uh, the rankings kind of reflect that for me. And as I'm looking at this, I guess the schedule I thought was maybe a little harder than it is. I'm looking at ESPN's rankings um, of defenses, and the 49ers are 21st against running backs, and St. Louis is 30th against running backs, and that's week 15 and 16. So if you're a team like Matt that, that you've got to buy in the first week of the playoffs, I mean, this is a great guy to, to buy into for that uh, late playoff run. But the next couple weeks, expect some, some, tough, uh, some tough games. Yeah, speaking of guys actually with great playoff runs, uh, the next guy we're going to talk about, Matthew Stafford. You know, I kind of talked about him and the Mary Cheat dump this week, so make sure you check that out to kind of take a look at what I think of him and over his next few weeks and through your fantasy playoffs. But, you know, he should have a great game here. You know, the Bucks have allowed multiple t- passing touchdowns to quarterbacks in six straight games, and not all the quarterbacks are the, you know, the, the lethal weapon-throwing quarterbacks you'd expect. I mean... It's quarterbacks like Matt Ryan twice had over two touchdowns in a game. Ryan Tannehill, Russell Wilson, Cam Newton. You know, maybe Wilson and, and Cam can kind of throw on you. But when Matt Ryan has two games like that and Ryan Tannehill, that, that just shows you how bad that pass defense is. Matthew Stafford and company should have a pretty good game here. And Nate Burleson's back, so that's only going to help him even more. What do you guys expect out of this game with uh, Nate Burleson back? I don't know how big of a factor he's going to be. Um, I, I don't know if Durham has been, you know, awful. I, I think he's still going to be involved. Um, one thing I did want to mention was Reggie Bush actually practiced today, which is different for what he's been doing all season. He's been getting Fridays off, so that was kind of interesting, was it because he didn't get much work last week and uh, fumbled, got benched. I don't know if you saw, but he guaranteed he's not going to fumble again this year after fumbling, I think, two out of the last three games. So uh, Reggie Bush is going to be interesting this game. Uh, yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll. I like Reggie Bush a lot personally, but um, you know we'll see a little bit more in this game. What were you going to say, Rob? I think I think. Uh, see, I I kind of think Burleson will have a little bit more of an impact. I think the Bucks will look to. I mean, how can you not look to isolate Calvin? I mean, I know he's a, he's an animal and he he really can't be. There's no defense that can cover him, and he's proved that. But I, I think I think Burleson will will play a role. Um, I'm playing Matt this week, so I'm hoping he doesn't. And Stafford, uh, you know, has a has a rough day. But uh, unfortunately, I don't see that coming. I think Stafford blows up, and I actually I like that whole offense. I think they're all uh, great starts this week with with some high potential. Yeah, speaking of speaking of high powered offenses that you're going to love this week, Packers against Matt's Vikings. I mean. <laughs> You know, Matt, what's worse? In all, in, in all honesty, I'm not going to make any joke. What's worse, the Vikings' run defense or their pass defense? Um, I, mean, besides, I, 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 mean, I guess I'm asking, how do you beat the Vikings besides put 11 healthy guys on the field? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd say they're both pretty bad. Hey, real quick on the Detroit-Tampa game, I just want to say uh, I'm pumped for that Calvin-Rivas matchup there, guys, so... Yeah, uh, that's something. That's gonna be some must-see TV, I think. Um, I don't want to talk about the Vikings. You want to keep talking about Calvin and Daryl Rivas? I. <laughs> well, I, I'll talk about somebody in the Vikings later in the bowl predictions. But, well, let me put it this way: We know everybody from the Packers is gonna have a huge fantasy day. Who is each of you guys? And I'll pick one as well. What player from the Packers is gonna finish with the most fantasy points? And exclude Tolzien because obviously quarterbacks typically score more points, but what wide receiver, tight end, running back, what have you, is going to score the most fantasy points this weekend for the Packers? Eddie Lacy. Yeah, for me it's Lacy, no doubt. I got him at my number three overall running back. Yeah, I was going to say, I would take Lacy too, although I wouldn't be surprised if a guy like Jarrett Boykin breaks out and has, you know, 150 yards and two touchdowns or something crazy, you know, breaks a big, big bomb or so in, in this game. Viking side, I kind of feel like this is just – you can listen to any podcast and keep hearing this from us, but Viking side, you're starting Peterson and nobody else. I mean, it's it's that bad for the for the Vikings. Well, Should you get you get Carlson there, Marcus. I know you kind of like him. You, yeah, Carl, Carlson in deeper leagues. I mean, right, still, right. He's still not a tight end one, but I guess if you're in 16 team league or you know something weirds going on where you can you have to play two tight ends, I guess you know he's he's a guy. Um, other than that, though, it, it's you know. Whatever. 
Yeah, he definitely is a guy. He's, he's a guy. He's a guy. <laughs> Matt, Matt's gone down there and checked and made sure that, that all the all the parts are intact. Um, <laughs> Chargers and Chiefs, guys. You know, I just want to say great job on getting it right this week. Last two weeks, you guys both had Danny Woodhead higher than Ryan Matthews. So congratulations for uh, coming back over to my side and, and seeing the light here on Ryan Matthews. You know, Woodhead kind of tearing it up early on in the year, but really hasn't had uh, anything going, you know, the last few weeks or so. And, and meanwhile, Matthew's kind of pouring it on, getting a lot more work here. And then I uh, just wanted to point out here, Chargers, fifth worst against opposing wide receivers. So Dwayne Bow, you think he's going to finally have his second, I'm going to say, usable game of the year? I mean, he's never going to be a great fantasy prospect, I think, for the rest of this year. But do you think he's flex-worthy in this game because of the matchup and because of what he did last week? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, just the law of averages. There's no way Dwayne Bow can have two solid games in a row. <laughs> that's my. That's the extent of my analysis on that one. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good. That's solid stuff right there. <laughs> I'll hold. I'll hold my uh, my comments till the bold prediction. No, no. That's that's going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bears and Rams. I, you know, I want to say why does Zach Stacy hate? Because I, I feel like we're all kind of a little low on him, even though we all have him as a running back one this week. I got him at seven. Rob, you got him at 11. Matt, you have him at 12. But like I said, I honestly think we're all a little too low on him. Five straight games with over 20 touches. Had his bye week to kind of rest up and prepare for a Bears defense that made Ray Rice look like Adrian Peterson. You know, for me, I got a bold prediction coming on a little bit later about Zach Stacy, but... You know, what are your guys' expectations for him? I actually agree with you. I think I probably should have him a little bit higher than 12, considering the matchup um, and coming off a bye, being nice and fresh and healthy. Uh, um, yeah, I, th- I think I agree with you. I, pro- I probably should be a little bit higher on him. Yeah, for, for me, I, I mean, I feel like it's almost like a Cinderella-type story. He, he's going to he, – I feel like this is going to be tough to – Sustain. I have him on on our in our home league. Um, I traded uh, I traded for him with you, Marcus. But um, I, I feel like my side. It's fine. We'll talk about my side about it in a second here. But uh, but for me, I think it, it's just too good to be true. Having this guy come off waivers and be a running back one as a rookie on the Rams. I mean, I I didn't see it coming when I made the trade. It was it was kind of a lucky trade, I think. But um, now that he's here. I mean, you got to respect them, but I still don't put them in that top, top at echelon of running back. So we'll see. Yeah, but that, I mean, that matchup is looking so good. And to your point about Le'Veon Bell earlier, he's getting the workload. He's getting huge workload. You know, last few games, like he's been getting 26, 28 touches a game. So he's getting the workload. And like I said, Ray Rice, Ray Rice ran all over the Bears defense. That's how bad they are. The Bears defense, I mean, remember back a few weeks ago when Brandon Jacobs ran all over the Bears, the Bears defense. You know, Zach Stacy obviously better than Brandon Jacobs, and this year probably better than Ray Rice. Um, you guys know I still have undying love for my boy Alshon Jeffrey, the other side of that that Zach Stacy trade that Rob was referring to a second ago. You know, I have him and Brandon Marshall inside my top ten, but when you step back and take a look at it, Rams secondary has stepped up big time lately. You know, zero touchdowns to wide receivers in the last two games only allowing 165 receiving yards to wide receivers on the season. Are you guys worried about the Bears receivers in this game? Do you think we're giving them a little bit too much credit because of their reputation so far this year? Well, the the Rams' defense um, in general has stepped it up recently as well. You know, obviously when the back end's playing like it has been, that's going to be the case. But uh, they also generate pressure pretty well. Um you know, Cutler, if Cutler was there, I think I might even be a little more concerned, you know, how he deals with the pressure. Uh, I just, the way they, they have both been playing, it's hard to put them too low in the rankings. Um, you know, as, as uh, here's this word, i got to get a new word. As talented as both of those guys are, it's just hard to, you know, expect them to not, not perform. Yeah, and, and McCown has proven that, that he, can, he can still utilize them to their full potential, you know, that... When Cutler went out, I think a lot of us got a little nervous, but McCown is, you know, he's stepping up. So as long as he's stepping up and, and, and getting them the targets, I think he's, uh, I think they're, they're all still relevant, as relevant as they were. 
I'll tell you what, I actually like for Alshon Jeffrey and Brandon Marshall's, Marshall's value, I actually like McCown in there more than Cutler just because Cutler kind of spreads it around to Martellus Bennett a little bit more, uh, kind of looks for Forte a little bit more out of the backfield. So, you know, I think it actually helps Alshon Jeffrey and uh, Brandon Marshall's value. That's funny. You just said Cutler spreads the ball around. Preseason, we never would have said that ever. Well, I, you know actually, what I mean? I, and you know what? I really should clarify by spread by spread the ball around. Those are the only four people yeah, I think that's true. That's targeted true. when he played. I think there was a few few targets to uh, Earl Bennett, but pretty much just those four guys. But I guess what I'm referring to is McCown is just kind of staring down Jeffrey and Brandon Marshall, not looking too much towards uh, Bennett and company. Panthers, Dolphins. Dolphins running backs, I mean, these guys, I think, stink worse than my buddy that works the sewer treatment plant. I mean... These two have just been horrendous since Incognito and the whole Jonathan Martin thing happened. You know, Miller just 19 rushing yards and Thomas just 55 over those last two games. Mike Pouncey has missed the last three practices this week due to an illness, and it's looking like he's not going to play. I mean, you just can't function as an offense when you're missing three of your offensive linemen in one game. You're starting offensive linemen. Guys, it's, it's not looking good for... Uh, for the uh, Dolphins running backs this week again. No, stay far away. I mean, you mentioned uh, possible three starting linemen out this week. And on top of that, you still don't really have a clue which running back is going to be week to week. So uh, you can't trust these guys. I would have to see two or three good games from one of them to, to actually start to believe in a row. Yeah, and, and by the way, we, we love sewer treatment plant workers. You know, keep listening to the pod. <laughs> You know, I'll keep, uh, keep, keep <laughs> sending us your questions. But um, but anyway, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's a timeshare with a horrible O-line. That, two recipes for disaster. I mean, a timeshare with a good O-line is, is bad enough. Uh, but with this O-line, yeah, it's definitely a stay away. I'll say this. Out of the two, I did rank Thomas higher this week, as did Rob. If you had to choose one, um, you know, because you're not starting either, but if you had to choose one to own, which one rest of the season would you rather own right now? Lamar Miller because of upside. If an injury happens to Thomas, I guess they probably have to turn to basically just Miller, and I think he's a better player. I could, agree. Couldn't I the same be said for Thomas, though? If Miller gets hurt, they're going right to Thomas? Yes, but I like Miller's upside more. I'm saying I like him as a player better. You know, take take one of take the one or the other out of the equation. Um, I like Miller better in that scenario. And, and Miller's touches maybe haven't been there, but um, Thomas played 26 snaps last week to Miller's 40, so Miller's still on the field more, and I think you know that'll eventually lead to, to more opportunity. I, I will say this, too. We, kinda, we talked about the Dolphins' offensive line a second ago. Obviously, if you have the Panthers' defense, you're starting them, uh, you know, no matter what the matchup is, but we could see a ton of sacks in this game with three offensive linemen missing. That could be just crazy the amount of sacks that they could have. Um, and then finally, just, uh, you know, touching on the Panthers side here, we're going to skip past their running backs because none of their running backs are really fantasy relevant right now. They're all eating into each other. But Cam Newton, since week six, has been the number four quarterback in fantasy. Dolphins are the number five defense against opposing quarterbacks. You know, something's got to give here, guys. We all have Cam pretty high this week. You guys aren't worried about those that uh, tough Dolphins secondary? No, because I don't think that offense in Miami is going to sustain a drive. They're going to be, you know, off the field quite a bit. Carolina's going to have plenty of opportunities. And uh, Carolina, um, Newton is a little unconventional. You know, when you're looking at stats against quarterbacks, uh, he sometimes does a little different than most. So um, I'm not worried about it. And like I said, the biggest reason is honestly I just think the, that – Offense in, in uh, Miami is going to struggle to move the ball and just give a lot of opportunities to the Panthers' offense. And if we uh, – th that's how I feel, too. If we had to give a stat line, I, I think Newton's going to get in the end zone on the ground, which, you know, I think in, in most leagues is worth more than even throwing it. So so for me, I think he'll, he'll do a little bit of everything. And, and that offense – that defense, I mean, Newton's such a unique quarterback that that defense – hasn't played, hasn't proven themselves necessarily against a quarterback like Cam with his versatile skills. So for me, I, I, I still like Cam in this matchup. All right, moving on to uh, Jets and Ravens. Matt, you know, I, I see Rob has uh, has an adult beverage that he's drinking. What, do you, what are you drinking tonight, Matt? 
Anything? Uh, I got some brisk iced tea. Wow. That's, Maybe uh, I can give him a little plug. It's uh oh, brisk is the is the brand name. Yeah, brisk. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would have assumed you would have been drinking something because I mean, Tory Smith, your number one wide receiver this week. Come on, man. What what is going on? Yeah, what is that all about? What's in that iced tea? Yeah, there's some. That's a Long Island brisk iced tea. I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it, it was it was just something about. The, the Jets defense, um, and I don't know, I guess more of a gut call. I just, I got a, I got a feeling that Torrey's going to have a big game. Um, I, I, I've never had him this high before, so call me crazy come next week, but I guess that could have been one of my bold calls. Uh, it definitely should have been over people like Calvin Johnson. Jeez, that's... Well, I, like Daryl Revis, I talked about it earlier. I, Revis is no slouch. I think he's going to make uh, things a little tougher for Calvin, uh, a little tougher than usual, of course. All right, well, uh, sticking on the Ravens' side of the ball here, last week Ray Rice had a 47-yard run. This season he's only had 47 yards rushing or more in a game twice, and obviously one of those games was last week. The Jets are the number two run defense. So i got to ask you guys, bigger non-injury bust, Ray Rice or Scarlett Johansson? Who's the bigger bust? Who's got the bigger bust? You going Scarlett Joe? You going Ray Rice? I hopefully you traded Ray Rice after that huge game last week because this is about as bad a matchup as you can get. Um, don't expect that again. I'm going to say the bigger bust is Ray Rice. Oh, that's, I agree. That's saying something. And that is um, saying something. <laughs> we all have Chris Ivory at 15 this week. We should probably move him down more. I mean, looking at it, Ravens third best against opposing running backs and have only allowed one rushing touchdown all year. And let's be honest, that Jets offense is anemic. Um, I will say this, you know, Geno Smith, it's a total gut call here, but I think he could be a top 15 quarterback this weekend. If you follow his and the and the Jets trend, um, he's up one week, big up, and then down the next week, and then big up the next week, back and forth. So last week after his worst week of the season, this you know, we could see his best week of the season. Matt, you apparently think that's more crazy than Troy Smith, the number one wide receiver. So, what do you what do you got? I don't know. I mean, he was benched last week. You know, I just that was Case Keenum, and Case Keenum's going to have a great week this week. You know, against a terrible Jaguars defense. Case Keenum being benched uh, was a little bit more of I think two weeks ago. You know, it's copycat league. I mentioned it. They were bringing some pressure. Uh, last week was more of the same, and he struggled. They're kind of figuring him out. Um, Gino, I just, I think you're right though. It's been kind of off and on, off and on with him. So if that's the extent of what you want to look into and uh, flip a coin, go ahead because that's about what he's been this year. Um, I just, I don't know. He got benched for for Sims. I, I, it's hard to hard to recommend him this week. Case Keenum got benched for Matt Schaub. Pick yeah. Matt Schaub. What what's the point? Did I have Case Keenum higher than him or something? No, no, no. I'm, I'm just They're saying. They're both awful. We're, we're pointing that you know he gets he gets benched for Sims here and Matt Shaw. I mean it's 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 Matt Shaw. I mean, and it could have been worse. You could have been starting Case Keenum in your home league, um, like some of us might have. Yeah, wouldn't. Yeah, I wonder who that was, Rob. I don't know. <laughs> um, and I'm not rec I'm not by any means recommending that you start Geno Smith this week. I, I'm just saying I, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I think there is a sliver of a chance there. Jaguars, Texans. Dougal, Rob and I have Andre Johnson at two, and you have him at six. You know, obviously, again, still a wide receiver number one, still a top player this week. But, you know, what made him kind of slip to number six for you this week? Well, you know, we do our rankings Tuesdays. I actually did them, like, Tuesday afternoon. There was no announcement on who the quarterback was yet. And I thought, you know, how do you, how do you give up on Keenum and then make him the starter ne the next week? I, I, I don't know. I just figured they were going back to the veteran. Um, and and Chubb is somebody who's against, you know, he's he's got one of those web pages. Do not throw Andre Johnson the football in the end zone. So uh, I just I, I thought it was going to be Chubb. That's honestly why I'd move him up, knowing Keenum's starting now. All right, um, MJD guys, a touchdown or double digit fantasy points in four of his last five games. I'm the lowest on him actually at 26, and our consensus is 23. You think we're too low on him, or do you think? I mean, he's kind of been producing lately. 
I mean, we got him as a running back two slash flex range. What do you guys think? You guys think that's too low? It's possible. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're, we don't know everything, I guess, but uh, it's just oh, I you're right. You're right, though. The numbers have been a lot more consistent than than any of us, I think, expected after the way he started the season. Um, so, yeah, we might be a little too low. I've talked about being a top 20 running back isn't saying much, and we've got him below that. I think he's been, he has been performing better than that, so, yeah, maybe you're right. Just not much of a ceiling with him, so. Yeah, and I, and I refuse to comment on MJD for the rest of the year. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But really, the... The the Texans, uh, you know, they're they're a good defense. You know, they have a reputation as being a good defense, but they've allowed they've allowed 100 rushing yards to backs in each of the last two weeks. So, you know, I, I think MJD wins this matchup, and I think we are probably a little too low on him. Talk about a flip flopper. I'd make a I'd make a great politician two weeks ago, ready to sell, and and this week saying we're too low on him at 23, but. Um, but he's uh, he'll get at a burger stand flipping burgers. <laughs> yeah. he's, but to to my defense, he's proven proven himself as of late. So I like I like I like too how I threw up burger stand like they still have those types of things. <laughs> um, <laughs> so just to show how anemic the Jaguars' offense is, how many games this year do you think Chad Henney has multiple touchdown passes in? I'm gonna say two. Rob. I'll say one. Zero. No. He has not thrown a two-touchdown game all season. Zero. On the season, how many touchdown passes does Chad Henney have? Um, he has eight. Rob? Uh, like six. Really, this is like a really bad like final Jeopardy right now. <laughs> <laughs> how many, Rob? I'd say six. Four. Jeez. Do you think everyone at home is going... Five, five, <laughs> six, six. <laughs> it, it's possible. I don't know. But <laughs> Henny is just terrible. Um, I mean, the Texans have allowed eight touchdowns in the last three games to guys like Matt McGloin and Carson Palmer. Andrew Luck, I mean, obviously he's very, very good, but McGloin and Palmer are getting good, you know, good touchdown totals. Hey, maybe, maybe we see Chad Henny hit, you know, two touchdowns this year in, the, in a game, and maybe this is it, but... God, is he bad? Just hey, I just thought of a great team name for next year. Suck <laughs> McGloin. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, speaking of great team names, Rob, you want to share what you changed your team name to this week? I did, I did. I'm uh, since I'm playing Matt this week, and I'm shocked, Matt. You haven't thrown out a dig yet so far. I was expecting a uh, some sort of confidence boost in the first few games we talk about here, but I'm uh, I'm Matt Dougal's ego this week, playing Matt Dougal, so. See how that goes. It that just works. doesn't work out. You don't score enough points to be my ego. <laughs> uh, so I don't. I haven't talked about. It, that's all. We'll we'll find out on Sunday night. Pretty much. We'll we'll know more or less by then. Hopefully, who who will be the winner there. But Titans Raiders. Chris Johnson only had two touchdowns in his first seven games before their bye. Since then, he's had four touchdowns in the last three games and six touchdowns over his last six games. Do you think the Titans have finally figured out how to use him, or do you think this has been all about schedule? That's It's a tough call. I think with me, anything I say about Chris Johnson this year has been the exact opposite. So why don't we go to Rob on this one? Yeah, for me, I mean, when he hit that middle of the year, everyone said that, that the matchups were there and, and that he would, uh, you know, he'd come out on top. But seeing that, Seeing that matchup against Jacksonville go so poorly, I, I mean, he has great games sandwiched between that Jacksonville game, which he did barely anything in. Um, so for me, I, he's too up and down. I mean, I don't even know if I would play the matchups with him. I think if you have him, you're playing him. But I, I couldn't tell you one week versus the next whether you know whether I think it's going to be his breakout week or not um, in comparison to the to the prior week. So. Until he, uh, I think if he can put up some consistent numbers the next couple weeks, that's when you feel comfortable playing him through the playoffs. But I really don't know which Chris Johnson's going to show up. Yeah, he's been very boomer bust. And, I mean, for me personally, I think it's a little bit of a mix between the schedule getting a little softer and then using him a little bit more. You know, there was a few games early on in the season where he was getting less than 10 carries a game and that type of thing. 
you know, very first few weeks of the year, we saw great great production from him. The first three weeks, I think he had almost 100 yards each of the first three weeks because he was getting those 25 carries a game. And I think they kind of need to get back to that and are trying to while still giving Sean Green a little bit more of the workload. Um, Denarius Moore, though, Matt, you know, Rob and I appear, apparently, according to your rankings here, are way down on him. You know, Rob has him at 53. I didn't rank him at all. Matt, you got him at 28. What do you like about Denarius Moore? Um, another one, we, we rank it early. I like Denarius Moore a lot better with Terrell Pryor. Um, and, and when Terrell Pryor is the Terrell Pryor we saw earlier when he was healthy, when he can move around, you know, like Terrell Pryor can. Um, you know, McGloin, Marcus, you mentioned on Tuesday, a lot of targets to, to Streeter. Could that be one of those Riley Cooper, Nick Foles things, you know, we're seeing again here in Oakland possible? Um, I like I like Denarius Moore as a player quite a bit more, so um, I'm just not ready to drop on him yet. But I, you know, you guys might just be a week ahead of me on this. One more week, like he's been producing, and I'll probably be right there with you. I don't know about not ranking him at all, um, but it's just tough because we don't really know what kind of a rapport these two guys have. We've had one game with with McGloin, so. Yeah, I mean, like I said uh, on the Tuesday podcast, you know, Streeter obviously getting the majority of the targets there, so. Like I kind of said, you know, we saw it with Foles and Cooper, and I think that's kind of how this is going to go, and that's kind of why I'm jumping on it so early. Rashad Jennings, though, guys, you know, we talked about him on Tuesday's pod as well and how well he's done over the past three weeks as the starter. Now he gets the Titans' run defense at sixth worst against opposing uh, running backs. They've allowed two rushing touchdowns in each of their last five games and so far this year have allowed 13 rushing touchdowns in just 10 games. Wow. I mean, Rashad Jennings should have a very, very nice day here. I'll talk about him a little bit more later. Um, you guys probably will as well. This this is going to be a huge game, I think. Colts, Cardinals. Rob, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but a week after you declared your hatred of Trent Richardson and vowing never, you vowed to never rank him again, correct? I don't recall that vow, but maybe. Who 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 was the player that you said you would never rank again? Trent Richardson. <laughs> what? Wow. I, I I might have said that, but you know. I thought it was Richardson. It might have been Roddy White. I thought it was one of the two. Either way, you ranked both. I mean, but let's talk about Richardson here for a second. You have him all the way down at forty-eight. You yeah. barely ranked him. Barely. Tell me about this. It's almost like a, a sympathy ranking. You know, you, a guy that was once at the top, all washed up pretty much now in terms of fantasy relevance. But, you know, it, and it, it, it wasn't because of his great week last week, I'll tell you that. But um, for me, it's, you know, I'm still stuck on the name. And, you know, the talent just doesn't – It this puzzles me. This is, it doesn't go of, away. It doesn't go away. I mean, how can one day you be – you know, a stud worth trading a first rounder for, and the next to be, you know, almost droppable from from fantasy teams. So for me, I'm holding out. I'll probably rank him in that, you know, that 50 to 60 area until he has a breakout game. And I actually, I, I believe that he's eventually going to, um, but but we'll see. But I I think he's going to have that game at some point. Yeah. Um, flipping over here to the Cardinal side of the ball. How many fantasy points do you think separates Larry Fitzgerald from Michael Floyd this year? What do you guys think? 13. A lot less after last week, but I'd probably say 10. Uh, Yeah, and I'm talking standard scoring here. Six points. Six Six points separates the two. I think next year this could kind of go the way of Julio Jones and Roddy White. And I think we may be seeing the beginning of, you know, basically what we saw a few years ago with, with Julio and Roddy. You know, I think Michael Floyd could might be able to overtake Larry Fitzgerald next year. Hopefully it's with a uh, little bit better quarterback than Carson Palmer, but we'll, we'll see. Speaking of, uh, you know, going over some of these things here, that, how many games this year do you think Andre Ellington has had more touches than Richard Mendenhall? I know... A lot of times we think about, you know, the carries and Mendenhall getting a lot of carries, but Ellington being involved in the passing game. So how many times does Ellington have more touches than Mendenhall this year? Twice. Rob? I'd say, I'd say once. Twice. 
Oh, wow. Arians just hates Ellington. I I don't get it. I don't understand it. He really needs to get just past that. It's it's. Uh, and one of those games, that Atlanta game, Mendenhall was out. So I mean, it's. Well, I didn't I didn't count that one because. Oh, you didn't. Okay. I mean, yeah. Obviously, you can have more touches than the guy not playing in the game. That's. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, we we had the same amount of touches as Rashard Mendenhall that week. So, I mean, uh, Cowboys Giants. All right, so I fought into the Andre Brown love, not apparently as much as you guys though. I have him at twelve. Rob, you got him at seven. Matt at eight. You guys both have him significantly higher than say a guy like Zach Stacy, who I talked about earlier. Any of you guys want to make a Zach Stacy versus Andre Brown wager? Anybody? No. You rank Brown higher, but neither of you are standing by it. I get it. Yeah. I'm That's sorry. Cool. I was just watching Lamar Odom on TMZ. I'll 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 do that. You you, you really you I'm really, gonna stand by my rankings. You're gonna stand by your rank. All right. So yeah. Andre Brown versus Zach Stacy. I say Zach Stacy. I say Andre Brown. I think because I love that matchup. Dallas <laughs> is a joke. That uh, wow, well, that that sounded very promising. I I like it. I think maybe. Sort of, kind of, <laughs> is the matchup, yeah. Um, all right, so guys, Miles Austin coming back in this game. Who cares, right? I mean, it, yeah, it, who cares? That's pretty much. What Stop you... it. Move on. <laughs> uh, all right, fine. Um, all right, so did you know that for as much crap as we give the Giants about their pass defense, they've actually really stepped it up and haven't allowed a passing touchdown since week six. I mean, think about that. Not a single passing touchdown. So a much tougher matchup than I think many people realize in this game. And i, I got to tell you, for, for that reason, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more later, but I'm going to move Romo a little bit down in my rankings. I mean, obviously not the same matchup it was at the beginning of the year. And then, uh, you know, I, I've kind of gone over this the last few weeks. Start your team defense against the Giants. Matt, I think you said last week that you, or earlier this week on the Tuesday pod, that you're starting to buy into that. But I, I, I couldn't quite understand. You have him ranked the lowest out of the three of us at 23. Rob at 19. I got I got the Cowboys defense at three. So apparently you're not buying into start the defense against the Giants. I I just had a lot of trouble recommending this Dallas, def, Dallas defense. Um, you know, as as good as your plan has been, and may continue to be. They've just been so bad. It's it's just you know I, I just I want to stay away from them regardless of who they're playing. They have a terrible pass defense, but on the flip side, Eli Manning is a terrible passer. <laughs> I mean, it kind of yeah, washes. Year. For for me, it kind of washes itself out. But let's talk about now the the Monday night game here. The game, I mean, the Sunday night game. The game that nobody cares about. Nobody's watching because. It hasn't been hyped up at all. I mean, really, we could use a little bit more hype for this game. But Broncos, Patriots, I mean, speaking of which, I just want to point out, did you guys hear about Gronkowski and what he said to Scott Zolak on the, the Hub 98.5? Did you guys hear about his uh, his whole time machine thing? The cars? And, no, what, what, go ahead. All right. Let me – just give me one second. I'm bringing it up here. I'm going to read you basically the transcript from – that uh, that radio interview. So Scott Zolak, if you could have a superpower, what would that superpower be? Gronkowski, man, like a time machine. And then Zolak says, you could be invincible. Gronkowski, <laughs> does time machine count? <laughs> Zolak, yeah, let's do it. We could build a time machine right here. Gronkowski, like if I could just be like, I want to go to Florida right now, then boom, I'm in Florida. <laughs> Zolak, that would be more like a transporter. <laughs> Gronkowski, yeah, is, is that a superpower? <laughs> I mean, my God, <laughs> that is just that is just painful. And I just got to share this one too, real quick, because I thought this was hilarious. This person basically took that transcript and took it a step further, if it was just even more Gronkowski-like. So, Zolak. That would be more like a transporter. Gronkowski, is that what Obama uses to read his speeches? You're thinking of a teleprompter. <laughs> is that the round thing with the spinny thing on top? That's a helicopter. <laughs> That's the flying animal that lived in the time of the dinosaurs, right? 
crazy. I, I love Gronkowski, but God, is he just so stupid. Um, but moving on to real fantasy relevance here, now that we get past all that crazy Gronkowski... Now knowledge. we're never going to have him for an interview yet. Jesus, come on. We were never having Gronkowski anyway. That, that was that was never going to happen. <laughs> um, no Sean Moreno. You all know that I'm a no, a no Sean hater. I, I mean, I've, I've talked about this. I, I, well, no, I probably don't hate him as much as Le'Veon Bell, but I, I still strongly dislike him. But apparently I'm drinking the Kool-Aid in this game because uh, I got him at four. Matt, you got him at seven. Rob at ten. I mean, apparently I'm the highest on him. New England did shut down the Carolina running backs last week, but uh, honestly, that's not that hard. Prior to that game, the Patriots have allowed over 100 yards rushing in five straight games to opposing running backs, and that's going to kind of happen when uh, you lose Will Fork and Mayo for the year. Um, you know, speaking of the Broncos here, just real quick, for some reason, I feel like Wes Welker will get a touchdown in this game. You know, still coming back from that concussion, but I don't think there's any chance he misses this game. What do you guys think about uh, the Broncos' side with Welker and Sean Moreno? With Sean, I ranked him a little lower because Monty Ball is slightly scaring me. Um, I don't know if he's turning into a t- touchdown vulture or not. We've seen an uptick in his production and his work basically since Fox has gone off the sidelines. Fox is a guy who doesn't really like to play his rookies, you know. So I, I don't know, just, just something to think about there. That's why I dropped Moreno just a little bit. Um, Welker, I mean, it's a concussion, so it's just something to make sure you really pay attention to this weekend. That can change, you know, on a dime. Um, I, I know Terrell Pryor, one of the games this year, was supposed to play last minute, didn't play, so they're, they're, they're a tricky thing. Just be careful with Welker. For me, I mean, it's it's the touchdown decline of these two. I mean, Welker was a touchdown machine at the beginning of the year, and he has one touchdown in his last four games. And then with Moreno not finding the end zone the past few weeks, I think he's sort of come back to reality of, of the actual talent he is. Not, I think a lot of his early season success is obviously the situation he has there in Denver, and he's getting the work. I mean, last week I think he had his season high in carries, um, but it didn't translate into, into the yards and, and, and the touchdown that he needs to be that elite guy. So for me, I... I The past few weeks, he's been trending more towards that uh, low-end RB1, very high-end RB2 running back, uh, and I think that's where he belongs the rest of the season. Hmm. Okay. Um, Just wanted to point out real quick, too, Julius Thomas here with his knee. You know, limited in practice yesterday and today. Jack Del Rio kind of suggesting that he needs to see improvement from Thomas uh, if he is going to play. I'm going to say this. I think if you're going to roll with the chance that Thomas plays, I think you have one of two plays. And, guys, tell me which one you would rather do. Would you rather go out and grab a guy like Joel Dreesen or Jacob Tammy and play them out of desperation if Julius Thomas is a no-go in this game? Or, and, and this is the way I would probably go, grab a guy like Logan Paulson who has bigger boom-bust potential because it sounds like Jordan Reed may not play on Monday night. Which way would you guys go? Would you hold out with Logan Paulson, who I think could do a lot better if Reed is out, or would you just take up uh, basic, basically the handcuff to Julius Thomas? I'd rather take up the handcuff because I don't think Paulson is any type of special player. Um, and I, and I think I think he's gonna play. You know, how the knee look last week on that 74 yard, you know, scamper up the sidelines. I I, I think he's gonna play. That was and wasn't that Thomas. two weeks ago? That wasn't the long touch. Oh yeah, yes, yes, you're right. But the, but it was the same. They had the issue then as well. For for me, I'm probably going Paulson. I'm more leaning uh, on your side, Marcus, with this, uh, just because. It, I don't think I'd ever handcuff a tight end. I mean, this question – well, this question alone is interesting because tight ends get are getting really thin. You know, it's it's a it's a shallow position, and not just at the 1-2 um, with Graham and Gronk, but also through the 2-8, the through eight, um, you see a big drop-off after that. So, you know, I, I'd probably side with Paulson. I might go out and get uh, Matt's Vikings Carlson if he's still around, but um, I probably wouldn't want to handcuff – my tight end, in the event that Thomas does say, okay, I'll give this a go, and then maybe Dreesen gets, you know, three-quarters of work or less. 
Well, I guess my point there was, you know, you mentioned Carlson, but Carlson's going to play obviously much, much earlier before we have a definitive answer on Julius Thomas. So I was trying to find obviously tight ends that you could stick in there last minute if you know uh, Julius Thomas isn't going to go. But since we've been talking so much about Logan Paulson and Jordan Reed, let's go ahead and jump right into the 49ers-Redskins game here. Well, hey, I just wanted to make it clear, Marcus, you weren't saying to handcuff a tight end. You were talking strictly no, for no. this week and only. Just yeah. for this week, just because, because of this is, yep. you know, okay. Graham level when he plays, but there is the potential he may not play. But yep. no, okay. I would never advocate uh, handcuffing a tight end by any means. Right. Jordan Reed, though, in this 49ers-Redskins game, still hasn't been cleared to practice. It's looking like he's really not going to play, you know, I guess if Reed is out, and with Hankerson going on IR, is Pierre Garçon poised for a huge, huge game here? Or, like I said, is a guy like Logan Paulson going to step up and get a lot of work in this game? What do you think happens if, um, obviously with Hankerson out, if Reed is out as well, Garçon blows up for 200 yards? Or, or who do you think comes in and kind of picks up the slack? Do you think it's more Santana Moss like last week? Well, I... I... I know last week, Garcon, post-game, was uh, kind of complaining a little bit about an injury. He's kind of getting banged up. Um, I think it was ankle, if I remember correctly, which I was wondering if it had something to do with those prior foot injuries he's had in the past. Um, another thing, too, about Paulson, I just this just popped into my head. It, it may not even be him. Um, I, I read on ESPN that it would be Fred Davis. So, yeah. it, I mean, you'd be, you'd be kind of guessing on those two as well, just kind of going back to the last segment. I don't know who it's going to be. I, 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 I kind of like the idea with Santana Moss, but, you know, he kind of came out and called out Robert Griffin a little bit about how telling, you know, saying he needs to be accountable like the rest of us. So, you know, are they in, are they in a good situation right now, those two uh, in particular? It's, it's going to be anybody's guess, I think. Yeah, for me, I, I'm with you, Marcus. I think Garcon is going to have a huge game. I think the injury, if you read the, the conversations that he was having with reporters – I think the injury was more just out of frustration, get me the heck out of here, I'm injured, I'm injured, get me Get me to a trainer. Just, I think he had had enough with, with the reporters and with the questions about um, that last play that I think uh, it was a little bit of, a little bit of maybe uh, exaggeration there. He's not even listed on the injury report this week. Um, so for me, I think Garcon has a huge day. All right. Uh, 49ers side. You guys know Colin Kaepernick, a guy I loved kind of at the beginning of the year and has kind of switched for me. A guy that I don't think I could even trust letting him hold my ice cream cone for five seconds in July because he'd probably just eat it on me. You know, I just don't trust this guy at all. Redskins are allowing the fifth most fantasy points to quarterbacks. It's the same defense that made Christian Ponder look like Brett Favre, for crying out loud. Um you know, and for that reason, like I said, Giants pass defense a little bit worse. Um, I'm going to be flip-flopping uh, my rankings of Colin Kaepernick and Tony Romo later tonight. You know, I'm going to actually move Kaepernick to number four over Romo. Rob, you're, you're shaking your head. What do, what do you think? Jeez, I'd put a bet on that. On Kaepernick over Romo? Of course. I, I don't feel comfortable about it, but, I, yeah, I would make a bet on that. I, I think... Kaepernick has a poor pass defense he's throwing on, and, you know, the Redskins don't have great rushing defense either because we could easily see one or maybe two rushing touchdowns like he's had in prior games. Like I said, I, big upside potential right there for Kaepernick versus Romo going against a Giants defense that hasn't allowed a passing touchdown in almost two months. Um, all right, so let's let's move on here. Let's, let's talk about flex, guys. Flex. Running backs, wide receivers. Flex. 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 We kind of like this, and uh, this time, like I said, we're doing a little bit different. We're going to base it off of questions that our fans have sent in to us, real flex questions that they have. So let's jump in here. we got four of them. Eric Florin, at that underscore red guy on Twitter, asks, Hakeem Nix, Ruben Randall, or Michael Floyd? Not exactly a, uh, a flex question when they're all wide receivers, but I told him to throw him into this and answer it for him. So which guy are you guys picking? Uh, I think I'm going to have 
Ruben Randall over Knicks, and I and I'd say based off of what you saw last week, it's hard to you know overreact on on, on one game, um, and that's not necessarily what the case is. Floyd has been a, a little more consistent as of late, so I think Floyd's going to be my number one there. Then Randall, then Knicks. I I actually I agree with Matt. Knicks hasn't scored in thirteen straight games. When I read that, I was shocked. Couldn't believe it, but. Uh, but I, you know, I I have trouble putting Randall over Knicks. But um, I think this week and moving forward, I think I would. Here's where I'm going to cop out a little bit here. There's the chance it sounds like that Hakeem Knicks may not play in this game. So for me, if Knicks is playing, I'm going with Michael Floyd. If Knicks is out, it's Ruben Randall, no question. Matt, I think you agree with that. Yes, I agree completely. A um, little bit of a cop out, but. Randall's been, you know, the touchdown guy there in New York, and if the targets are going to be there, which have been on a downturn for him, um, you know, obviously with Knicks out there, there's going to be a lot more opportunity. I agree completely. He's, I think, far and away number one out of that. And I think Randall scored in five of his last six, almost the opposite of Knicks here. So yeah. I, I definitely agree. All right. Jason Davis at Jason underscore P underscore Davis asks, need one out of Bobby Rainey, Alfred Morris, Shane Vereen, Kendall Wright, I think we're all going Alfred Morris there. So let's just throw him out for one second and look at the other three. Bobby Rainey, Shane Vereen, Kendall Wright. Which one would you guys take out of those three? Um, out of those three, I'm going to say... I'm actually going to say Bobby Rainey. Rob? This week, I'm going to actually say Kendall Wright. Wow, I was going to say, for me, it's between Rainey and Vereen. They're really close, and I would probably go with Rainey just because of the workload. Um, so next one, Jonathan Golan at jgolan1 asks, another another Bobby Rainey one, Bobby Rainey, Lamar Miller, or Jarrett Boykin and a half-point PPR? I'm going to go Bobby Rainey. I, I think I think Minnesota's going to struggle this week. Um, imagine that, and I think – I. Like I said, I think there's going to be a lot of pounding of the football with Eddie Lacy. So Boykin, you know, one of these wide receivers is going to have a big day. You know, Minnesota's awful, but who knows which one it's going to be. But I think Lacy is going to be the feature point in that in that game plan. So I'm going to say Rainey again. If there's anything that uh, Matt's Vikings Vikings know, it's how to take a pounding. Rob, what do you got? I uh, I'm actually going to go Boykin here. I don't have as much faith as Matt, that Rainey might get involved in the passing game. So for me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go Boykin. Yeah, I'm going Boykin too. I, I like Boykin a lot this week. I really, really have the feeling he has like a 50-yard bomb that he just catches in this game. I just have a huge gut call on that. Andrew Freeman at a Friedman 15 asks, Ray Rice or Jarrett Boykin? He's concerned about the Jets shutting down Rice. Um, I'll start off and say I am too. I'm not concerned about the Jets. Not only am I not concerned about the Jets shutting him down, I'm concerned about 90% of the defenses out there shutting down Rice. He's been atrocious this year. I'm going Boykin there. What do you guys think? Yeah, you know, last week Ray Rice had a nice game, um, but if you saw the field, it was a pile of mud, and that's basically what he's been running through all year from the looks of him. So kind of like he had some practice at that. Maybe the Bears' D didn't. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree, Marcus. I think – Jets, of course, is is the best, one of the best to, to shut him down, but just about anybody's going to shut down Ray Rice this year, so I'm going Boykin. Yeah, and, and for those new to fantasy football, we don't play based on last week's statistics, so <laughs> just, yeah. just saying that we're <laughs> focusing on the week ahead. So, uh, Rob, what do you got? Don't even have to ask me. This is the one we're unanimous on. I'm going Boykin, too. Yeah. All right, so make sure you guys follow us on Twitter, me at Marcus Katkin, Matt at Matt Dougal, and Rob at R. Druin. Make sure to keep sending your questions to hashtag blindsidepod or blindside at blindsidefootball.com. And uh, make sure, you know, if you have questions Sunday morning, make sure to hit Matt, Rob, and I up every Sunday from noon until kickoff. Send your start sit questions to hashtag askblindside. And, if you know, we're always looking for more fantasy football bloggers, so if you think you have what it takes, send us a couple of your writing samples to career at blindsidefootball.com and let us take a look at them. Guys, it's almost time for the end of the show, but before we go, bold prediction time. I actually uh, have quite a few this week, so I'll run through them real quick. I say, number one, Zach Stacy finishes as the number one running back in fantasy this week. Uh, Rashad Jennings, 
18 plus fantasy points. He's probably going to be a top five guy. Um, Ray Rice, another guy I think is going to get shut down again. Less than 40 rushing yards. Daniel Thomas will outscore Lamar Miller two to one. And then finally, Vincent Jackson over 20 fantasy points. Who you guys got for your bold predictions? I got Frank Gore going 150 and two touchdowns. 49ers coming off two losses in a row. Um, I think they're going to feed their stud, and the Redskins have allowed the second most fantasy points to running backs in the league. Also, 13 rushing touchdowns, which is also the most. Um, I'm going crazy here. I got Eli going for 375, three touchdowns and just one pick. It's going to be an Eli blast from the past here. I, I, I love I love the matchup. The Cowboys letting up over 22 points a game. That includes Week 7 when the Eagles uh, put up 4.9 as a group of quarterbacks. By 22.2, I, I meant against fantasy quarterbacks. So I like Eli's matchup, uh, kind of a gut call. Um, and then this one's kind of not, not one that's going to win anybody's week, but based on Adrian Peterson missing two days of practice this week, something he usually doesn't do, uh, it's a lost season in Minnesota. I could see the, Toby Gerhardt 55 and a touchdown. Like I said, not going to win anybody's uh, league. Um, the, but but I can see him getting some more work. The Packers, they've let up over 16 points a game to opposing running backs in the last four. So nothing that's going to win your game, but I guess that says I don't expect a big game from Adrian. Yeah, and I think, Matt, that last comment, you know, I got Adrian in a home league, and I've, I've got him handcuffed with Gerhard already. I think if it's not going to win you this week, it might at least not lose you uh, down the road when he, if he does go out. So that's a good call getting the handcuff there for sure. My bold predictions, I got, I'm going to stick with the Vikings. Uh, I'm going to go Correll Patterson here. He's, he's led the Vikings with nine, with nine targets uh, in week 11, but he, he only had three for 28. So, you know, not a great day, but he led them in targets, and I think that keeps going, not to mention his, his returning ability. I think he gets 150 yards and a returning touchdown uh, in, in this game. Uh, and my second one at tight end, we talked about how it's a little thin. Um, Garrett Graham, uh, he's coming off a, a, a great game where he got 13 targets for 136 yards, and, and Jacksonville is is not a great defense against the tight end. So I like I like Graham for a, a repeat, I'd say, 125 yards and a touch. Um, and then lastly, uh, I'll go, uh, I, I think Marcus maybe uh, shot this down during the cast, but uh, I'll go Dwayne Bowe. He's been targeted 26 times in the last two weeks. They want to get him involved. He's only caught 11 of those targets, so it's a bad ratio. Uh, and, and you know, I think a lot of that is a uh, Alex Smith as a quarterback not being comfortable with um, you know anything but checking down pretty much. Um, so that percentage, I think, it is it is probably fairly accurate, but I think it has nowhere to go but up. And I like Bo uh, to break. Very bold prediction again. I repeat, very bold. Uh, 10 catches and 150 yards and a touch. Yeah, I, th- I think the two key, the key things in the in the bow thing there were number one, they want to get him the ball, and number two, it's Alex Smith. So, um, but uh, I guess that'll do it. Unless you guys got anything else, you guys want to add anything? Uh, no, we got to get the hell off here so I can go play my new Xbox One. Oh jeez, have you <laughs> anything? No, nope, good to go. Good luck this week. All right, guys. We'll uh, we'll talk to you guys on Sunday. Bad luck this week, bro. Oh yeah. You? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, check it. It's my time. I'm rapping about Blindside Fantasy Football Podcast in this rhyme because they got me the inside scoop on Adrian Peterson. Yeah, he's that dude on Cam Newton. Yeah, they give me the news more on Megatron, Calvin Johnson. If I stay tuned on all quarterbacks, all. Three happens to be the fastest QB in the league. In fact, Colin Kaepernick is rider QB for them 49ers. It ain't hard to see, uh. Some awesome people hosting Marcus Katkin and Matt Dugall. You should be joining skinny or fat, short or tall. Anyone can tune in to Blindside Football. Have a try, dude. Listen on iTunes or BlindsideFootball.com too, uh.